Hi, my name is Colin, and today I want to talk about the most fun you can have building a car, and that is building an exo car. What is an exo car? Awesome question. I didn't know what this was until about two years ago when I first saw Hoonigans build their shark cart. Basically, you just take any car and you cut as much of the body off and rebuild it with a tube chassis. This is really cool because it gives you a full working car. If you've ever tried to build a car, trying to like understand drivetrain, suspension geometry, and how it all works together, you don't have to do any of that when you build an exo car. You're reusing all of the drivetrain, all of the suspension, all of the main parts of the car, and you're really just rebuilding the aesthetics of it. Your cabin, doors, the front bumpers, rear bumpers, and it's a great way to start building a really fun car that's street legal and it looks like a go-kart. As with most projects you're gonna do, the first step is gonna be research. I really recommend starting with local laws and any kind of regulations your county or state might have. For instance, I live in Ohio, and our county does not have e-check, but we have a lot of rules and regulations around rail buggies that can be on the road. So there was a, a good structure I could follow already that pretty much rolls over entirely into the exocar space. But I highly recommend, first things you should do, look at your local DMV, get the booklet, look at everything that makes a vehicle street legal. Turn signals, airbags, um, you know, the brakes, everything that you need, bumpers, every state, every county is gonna be different. Think about how bad it would suck if you did all of this work. You bought the car, you've got skin in the game now, and you can't even drive it on the road. Seriously, take the time. Even call your local state highway office. They were very helpful for me to help give you all of the things they look for when they pull someone over. They're going to be a great resource for you. So definitely call around, find out what you need to do to this car to make it street legal. The next thing you're going to look at is the budget. How much money do you have to spend? This is different for everybody, so it's very subjective. On the low end, I think you could build a very baseline exo car three to five thousand dollars and that's assuming you have all the tools but if you're starting you don't have anything you're starting from scratch you're building your shop you're probably going to be between ten to fifteen thousand dollars to have a baseline exo car assuming you do all the work and you won't know the tools what are we going to slice and dice into our exo car there's a lot of variety in here and i think a really good place to start is finding the average tuner car that's going to be 20 years old so we're looking at honda civics volkswagen jettas gti's mostly front wheel drive cars. They're just a little bit lower cost. They're easier to acquire and they're a little bit easier to chop up too when you're gonna gut the entire vehicle. But do your research, there's a ton of options. E36, E46 are a great car if you're looking for a rear wheel drive, if you wanna do some sliding around. I personally chose a 2001 Audi TT Quattro. I really wanted all wheel drive and I really wanted something turbo. Because when you drive and that turbo is just blasting boost in your face, there's nothing like it. The next part is the first step of designing. What do you want the car to look like? I googled a lot to find out different vehicles. What is someone else already built? I like to build something that no one's ever built before. For better or for worse, I just like to know that it's the only one, it's one of one straight from my garage. So do your research, look on Google. But some considerations you should make, for me I spend a lot of, a lot of time to think about the windshield because I think there's a good split. Some cars, they leave the windshield and the framework around it to keep the glass there, um, the wiper blades and everything. I personally chose to get rid of all the windshield, wiper blades and everything. That way I could put a polycarbonate sheet up there in the future. But consider that. Are you gonna keep the windshield or are you not gonna keep the windshield? Because I think it really changes the look of certain cars if you choose to keep it or get rid of it. The next is gonna be the tube you're gonna use. So there's two primary kinds of steel tubing that you're going to buy, chromoly or DOM tubing. Chromoly is top of the tier, premium race tubing, a little bit thinner, way more expensive. DOM tubing you can get from onlinemetals.com. And I went with 1.75 inch, 120 wall DOM tubing. That is a very beefy tube. It's going to handle everything you need. If you were to get in an accident and have a total rollover, assuming you followed best practices with building a roll cage, that tubing is going to keep you alive. It's time to take inventory of the tools that you have in your shop because this, this could be one of the most expensive parts of this entire project if you're starting from scratch. Because not only do you need the basic mechanic sets of socket wrenches, impact drivers, hand tools, power tools, but you're going to need 
somewhat specialized tools just for metal fabrication, especially tube chassis fabrication, one of your most expensive buys is going to be your welder. If you don't have a welder, you absolutely need one for this project. But the good news is there's a variety of price points you can get with a MIG welder. And that's where I would recommend if you've never welded before in your life, start off with a MIG welder and make sure it's a gas shielded MIG welder. Usually the lowest core welders are a flux core, meaning the wire that's fed through the trigger has a flux on it. And as you weld, it blasts a bunch of smoke up to make sure oxygen doesn't penetrate your weld. A gas MIG welder has a mixture of argon and CO2 that while you're welding, it'll protect that weld and keep it shielded. That's going to be what you absolutely need for this project. If you only have 120 volts in your garage, that's okay too. I would prefer to see a 220 volt welder. You can push more heat, especially with a 175, 120 wall steel tubing. You just, you need that power to be able to push in that weld into that tubing to make sure you have full penetration. The price point on this, it, you can find them for under $200 on Amazon, but I ended up going with the Harbor Freight. It was the 170 titanium, the green one. I think it was $500. I'll put the link in the description below, but that thing worked really well. It's, I used it at 120 volts in my garage and I had zero issues with it. I did have to keep that heat cranked up all the way because it had a tendency not to get full penetration with the welds. So again, if you can get a 220 volt welder and you have that access in your garage, definitely do it. Right behind the welder, you're gonna need a tube bender. Unlike exhaust where you can buy pre-bent mandrels and weld all of them together, when you're doing a roll cage, the entire tube, including the bend, has to be one seamless piece for safety. So we need to be able to add bends into it along the way. And sometimes you may have two bends in one pipe. This is where it gets a little pricey because there's a lot of options between what you're gonna see at Harbor Freight and what anyone else in the industry is gonna use. Let me be very, very clear. There's a major difference between a tube bender and a pipe bender. If you go to Harbor Freight and you're walking by the English wheels and the band saws and you see a tube bender for $200, it is not for this project. That's for conduiting super thick wall tubing for running electrical. If you try to bend DOM tubing or chromoly with that, it's gonna kink and just fold it like a taco. Stay away from them. You need to find a tube bender that has almost a full 180 or a 360 degree die, as well as uh, it's gonna be another rectangular block with the cutout on it. So it's gonna wrap it around and what happens is as you're bending the tube, it's gonna keep it formed and round. A few popular models are like the JD2 bender. I ended up going with the Trick Tools Pro Tools bender and that was hydraulically driven. Now I know I didn't provide every tool that I use in this build for the Exocar, but if you look in the description or if you search on YouTube, I'm gonna create another video called All the Tools You Need to Build an Exocar. And I'm gonna talk about the different brands and price points of welders, plasma cutters, um, tube notchers, everything you're gonna to need to do a exocar. So keep an eye out for that video. And please, the last thing you do before you start your exocar build is like and subscribe to this channel. Do you have all the skills you need to build this car? We're talking multi-domain skills you need to have here from electrical, bodywork, welding and fabricating, basic mechanical skills, engine skills, drivetrain. You kinda have to know a little bit of everything to do this all by yourself. And I fit in that category. I'm, I've been welding and fabricating, working on cars, building them. I'm not a master of any of them, but I have experience in all of them. And I know I'm comfortable doing it. So I was able to accomplish all my goals all by myself from design, engineering, fabrication, paint, and putting it on the road. But keep that in mind. If you don't know how to weld and fabricate, you may have to pay someone to weld the car for you or even paint. If you don't know how to paint or you're not comfortable doing it, you're gonna have to pay someone to paint it or let it rust while you drive. Keep it in mind, what skills do you have and what skills are you gonna need to bring in to finish your project? I would also recommend setting a goal on what you're really looking for the car. Are you trying to build a big horsepower monster you can take to the drag strip? Or do you want an everyday cruiser like me? I wasn't as concerned about making it a show car, rather just making it kind of something no one's ever seen before. So for me, I just wanted to make the car very unique. Uh, but other people may want to go to like a very specific uh, roll cage spec or they may want something that's more sleek and elegant. Some people may want to have perfectly TIG welded seams every step of the way to show off all of their amazing fabrication skills. That wasn't me. You know, everything on my car is about 
it's good enough. You know, put it on the road. But set your goals. Set your expectation of what it's going to be like at the end. Because I get in that car every day and I am happier than hell to be driving it because it's exactly what I set my goals to be. When it comes to actually buying your donor car, you have a few options. You could go on the low end and when you're looking at low end cars, it might be worth it for you to buy a rebuilt title car because they're typically heavily discounted and you're still going to get a great car. But if you have a little bit more money, then maybe you can buy a car with a clean title and uh, maybe it was wrecked. Maybe it had some like body damage along the way, hail damage, whatever. I think the ideal car for this is going to have a whole lot of cosmetic damage because you can negotiate. You can talk to that owner and say, nah, I wish this car was in better condition, but you know you're going to gut it and you're going to turn it into uh, something way different than what it is, but they don't know that. So try to find cars with lots of body damage, not frame damage, body damage. And if you need to get a rebuilt title too, that's totally cool. One thing I would recommend though is stay away from a salvage title. Even though a rebuilt title was a salvage title at some point, that rebuilt title, you can take it directly to the DMV, get a plate for it and put it on the road. If you're starting off with a salvage title, you're gonna need to fix that car first and make it a running car and then go take it to an inspection agency, get it certified for a rebuilt title, then take it. I prefer to work with a car that's already, it's ready for place. You just gotta go get it, take the paper to the DMV, and do it. Congratulations, you have finally got your car. This is the point in the video we finally get to get past all the research and let's start talking about building this thing. We have the car. What do we need to do now? Where, where do we go? Before you do anything to this car, please take it to the DMV, get license plates, take pictures of it, get it insured. Do all of these legal requirements while your car is still the most of a car it's ever gonna be for the rest of its life. Get the car running. If you bought a car, hopefully you bought it and it was in perfect running condition. That would be the ideal state. For me, I bought a car that had a timing belt that broke. It's an interference motor, so the valves and the head were trashed. I had to rebuild the motor. Do all that stuff before you start doing the tube fabrication. Ideally, maybe before you start demoing the car. I like to, I waited though until I cut everything off the car to make sure everything was back in it and running. That way I had the most accessibility to everything. I could easily pull the motor because there weren't any tubes in the way. I had the most accessibility to all the wiring. Let's gut it. This is where the fun really starts. Start taking out the seats, hood, trunk, doors. Take off all the easy parts you can easily unbolt. At this point, I wouldn't recommend cutting anything on the frame or the engine bay, but definitely everything you can take off this car that comes off with a nut and a bolt, do it. Put it all together, get a pile of all of these car parts, and just hold on to them. Take off everything that you can. Another important thing with every connector that you take off, make sure you take the time. Put masking tape and use a Sharpie, and on both sides, write where that harness came from. Sometimes you may not know what the connector is going to. You may have a random body connector inside the car, and it just plugs to something. You don't know what it is. Totally cool write down where it was, like underneath passenger seat, connected to black box. You may not know what it was, but when you're gonna be tracing these wires and you have to go back during the final build process, at least you have some area of where it was so you can Google what it was connected to. You may not need to worry about it, but maybe the car doesn't run right. Uh, those will be the, the clues that you need to be able to figure out where it went to. Once the car is fully gutted, You've got everything sitting in a giant pile of car parts in the side of the garage. Now it's time to start thinking about what are we gonna cut up? How are we gonna cut it up? So we're gonna start from front to back. I started at the engine bay. You know, I took the radiator support off and I just started looking inside the wheel wells and looking at the all the, the welds, the robotic welds where the, the unibody was welded together. So inside the fender wells, I tried to follow a lot of the weld lines from the unibody frame and I use that as a template for me to take off as much as possible. But think about it, when, when you're cutting the stuff out, you'll see, you'll notice what is structural and not structural. Some things will be very thin sheet metal and you can dent it with a hammer. Other places you may hit it with a hammer and get a really loud thud. So you need to make mental notes. If you take metal away from those areas where there's multi-layers of metal welded together, those are structural and you need to consider did you take and weaken those spots? If you did, 
you need to figure out a way to have a mounting plate and run some type of tube to it so you can reinforce it with your exo cage. Once all the teardown is done, you've chopped away most of the metal that you think you're going to need to get rid of. This is a good time to start taking pictures because I found it very useful to be able to take pictures of the car. I actually used my DJI Mini, the, the Mavic Mini drone, and I flew it right over top of the car. And I'll put some pictures up right here. And I took pictures aerial of the car and from the side, front and back. And then I used remove.bg. It's a website, awesome. You can go there and remove the background off almost any picture. And I used that so I could get really cool images that I could start tracing and designing the roll cage and starting to figure out how's all of this gonna get put together. That's the first step of the, the tube design. I took all of those and I'm a SolidWorks person. I love 3D CAD modeling. So I actually took my iPhone 13 Pro and I used a Polycam. It's that LiDAR scanning app and I scanned the entire car and I put that in SolidWorks as a STL file. And that's how I built the entire tube chassis. So I was able to understand how much tubing I needed and I could build a really nice 3D CAD model of the car. You gotta sketch it. You gotta put some type of uh, idea of how much tube you're gonna need because this is the baseline measurements you need to figure out how many linear feet of tube you need to order because the next step of this project is gonna be ordering tube and getting some of the things that you need uh, to start building. With your sketch completed and you have some framework of what the car is gonna look like, there are some parts I would recommend buying and installing in the car before you ever bend one tube. First one would be wheels and tires, suspension, and your seats. Those are things that are gonna help dictate where are you gonna sit in the car, how low is it gonna to be to the ground, are you going a much larger rim diameter, maybe you add wheel spacers for a wider uh, stance. Make sure anything that's gonna affect the appearance of the car with the tube chassis you're gonna build, you should probably buy that ahead of time and put it in the car. When I went to order tubing, I went to a website called onlinemetals.com. I'm not sponsored by them, I'm not sponsored by anybody, any product or website for this video. But they have really good stuff. I've used them. Their selection is excellent. You can get tons of plastics and metals, but it is going to be a little more expensive, especially with the LTL shipping. I bought in 16 foot sticks of uh, that 1.75 inch 120 wall DOM tubing. And the price is going to vary depending on when this video comes out. Steel prices have been very up and down. So be prepared to spend a little money on that tube. But if you have, look on Google Maps, look at Metal Supplier on Maps and call around and get quotes from them. Because a lot of times you could probably get it 20 to 30% cheaper locally. You'll save more money on shipping and they'll personally deliver it to your doorstep instead of using a carrier like Penske or yeah, some other freight company. A good thing to keep in mind when you're setting up to start fabricating your tubes is put the car on jack stands and also make sure the car is level. That was another mistake I made where the car was on unlevel ground and the, it was just hard for me to get good baseline measurements on different tubes and make sure they were the same height off of the base of the car and up. And symmetry is gonna be something that you're gonna to wanna to spend a lot of time on, especially those first two or three bars. The first bar you're gonna bend is your main hoop. And then after that, you're probably gonna start working your way forward down to the A pillars. But symmetry, spend time to make those first bars perfectly. And this is a good time, have the seats installed too. When you look at the front of the car, you're gonna to wanna to see perfect symmetry from the tubes, from distance, the gaps from the side of the seat to the bar. Remember, an exo car is not like a, a, any other car. You're gonna see every angle of that tube in relationship to the chair. So when you walk around the car, it's actually more obvious to find mistakes where something is not symmetrical. Maybe a seat is closer to a bar on one side than another side, or maybe the height is lower than another. It just stands out so much. As you get through the project, you'll find that the roll cage goes really quick. And the really cool thing is once you're done with the roll cage, you're almost done. One of the best things about an exo car is you're already starting with a working car. You don't have to worry about like complex suspension geometry. You're just gonna reuse the stock stuff at first and maybe you wanna upgrade it now or later, but you don't have to. It's already a running car, just send it. So you've got your tube chassis done, you're ready for paint. So I chose to go with a base coat clear coat uh, I went with uh, Snapper Rocks Metallic Blue from BMW, and it's a beautiful color. I really liked how it popped in the sun, and at nighttime, it's like a dark blue. In the daytime, it's more teal 
a lot of metallic flake in it. But look at different paint options. I would keep an eye on the road for cars that you see driving by that really pop at you. Choose the color you like. And I think the biggest question you're gonna have is, can you build a paint booth and is it worth it? Once you rip off all that masking tape, you just got finishing touches now. You know, for me, I added some headlights I found on eBay. I did one of the truck bed, uh, plug it into the trailer hitch, like the LED, like the four row LED flexible tail light. I found that to be really easy. It's super bright and it's easy. I don't know. I, I wanted it on the road more than I wanted it to look perfect. So I luckily I labeled everything really well. So when I was going to install these finishing touches, I knew which ones were my low beams, my reverse lights. I knew all of those things. So it was a really simple plug and play application for all those bits I needed to add. I put my mirrors on it, a rear view mirror. I made sure I had all those street legal requirements for a vehicle. I was done. It was great. The first thing I did, I started driving it that day and I've had, I've never had more fun in a car in my life. Seriously, exo cars are the go-karts of the street. You have to be safe. You know, don't do anything stupid. You have to remember you're in a car that is significantly modified and you have to trust your fabrication and your design. And I trust my fabrication and my design. I can have fun with it. You know, still be a safe driver. Don't be an idiot. Don't drive your car recklessly. You put everyone at risk. So go have fun at the track. Go find an empty parking lot. Seriously, go build an exo car, man. They're so awesome. But I've had so much fun talking about this. Like and subscribe to this channel. I'm going to keep doing exo car videos. I'm going to keep talking about cars because we're car people here. Thanks for tuning in. Awesome. Awesome? <laughs> what? <laughs> that was so stupid. I'm losing my mind. Can I redo that? Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>